breathing. If babies can do it, why can't machines do it? Thoughts, Dr. Haas? I think they can. You think they can? Okay. Welcome to Physician Founded, a series where we chat with physician founders who are shaping the future of medical technology and healthcare. My name is Jeff, and our guest today is the unparalleled Dr. Harvey Haas, trauma surgeon, humanitarian, innovator, software engineer, founder, and CMO of Learning Health System Labs, and so, so much more. Harvey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? It's uh, it's a busy day. Hay fever is just really getting to me right now. I've like popped a loratadine already, but it, it's it's not touching it. Um, I'm in severe distress. Uh, but um, we've we've chatted a little offline about your background, and like there's there's so much to get into in terms of who you are overall. So I I, I really don't know where to start. But maybe a good place to say uh, a good thing to say would be that you didn't take the straight path into medicine like I did, or like many others do. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you ended up in trauma surgery or why you chose that path? Sure. Um, I can't think I, I did my medical school at the uh, University of Calgary, uh, and it was a pretty progressive program there. A lot of my colleagues didn't take the straight path, uh, to medical school. And I think that's probably the reason why I got in there, but I certainly didn't. Um, I knew I wanted to be a trauma surgeon before, uh, I entered university, I think, um, uh, as I had told you before, I had a lot of, uh, late night jobs, just roadies for bands or, you know, jobs that were sort of out of business hours. And unfortunately also the hours where drunk people were driving on roads and, uh, I managed to be, uh, the first on scene for a few sort of big crashes and, um, really didn't know what to do at the time before cell phones. So it's not like he just pulled the phone out and called 911. Um, I, I didn't know where to go, how to help, you know, these people were sort of dazed and confused. And I just, I, I hated that feeling of helplessness. You know, I vowed that uh, I wouldn't allow that to happen. If I, if there was a way to learn how to, to fix them, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so that was sort of the. The first thing that sparked my imagination. I mean, I, I'd watched all the sort of the war, sort of like the mashes, TV shows and things like that. So I, I kind of knew that I kind of wanted to be a war surgeon, but I, um, I thought it was cool, but I also thought a lot of other things were cool. And, uh, it wasn't until I started seeing injured patients that I knew I wanted to help them. I guess just as a quick response to that, why not go with the military route then? Yeah, I, uh, I had the opportunity and the opportunity still exists. Um, I, I guess it's a philosophical choice. I'm, I'm more of a humanitarian and not to say that there aren't humanitarians in the military. I know several, um, but for me, the, uh, the non-military aspect of it is where I want to intervene the most, uh, most injury in fact comes uh, from outside military settings. So uh, unfortunately what we're seeing now is going to change that, but. Um, certainly for the vast majority of the earth on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not more time situations. And I, I think I can have more impact there. We talked a little bit about your non street line route. Um, you, you did a little software engineering, was it? how did you get there and how did that lead to, I guess, your further education before medical school? Because I mean, it's certainly really a not traditional, like four year undergrad, then medical school route that, right. that you went down. Um, I guess I wasn't good as a traditional student. Um, but when I was young, you know, this would have been the early eighties, very early eighties. Uh, my dad was working in the field where they were just starting to use computers, uh, and writing software at work. And, uh, I remember he brought home the first home computer or one of the first home computers uh, in the early eighties. And, um, it was a Franklin. 2E, I think it was an Apple clone way, way back then before Apple would sue you for cloning them. And, uh, I remember setting it up and just, you know, it was looked like part like a TV and part like a typewriter. And I had no clue what to do with it. Um, I remember turning it on and seeing the little, uh, prompt, uh, at the front and I had, I typed things in, nothing happened. It just didn't speak my language, but I had a family friend who was in high school. Uh, at the time, and I was probably, oh, in grade three. Um, and he could 
code. He could make this machine do things. And I remember just being enthralled with that. So I would just watch him code things. He'd come over and, cause we had one of the only ones in the neighborhood and, uh, just make it do things. Um, and I remember being really amazed by this language that you could use to control a machine. Uh, and then I started thinking in my first attempts were like, I think probably a lot of people learn how to code or games or graphics or something. Um, cause it's fun. Uh, but I really started thinking about how to solve problems with this, even at that age. And I remember I was at school in elementary school and I was leaving and my teacher was staying and, uh, she was doing the grades, like the report cards for everybody by hand. And I remember thinking, I know how to do that on a computer. Uh, and I could write a little, I guess we didn't call them applications back then, but I could write something that she could use to do that. So she wouldn't have to sit there all the time. So I wrote something for him. I think I still have the, the code for it. Um, and I gave it to him and I, and she was so, I guess, thankful, but also surprised that this machine, which they didn't even have yet, uh, could do this. And so I, I don't know if they ever went on and bought it, used my software, but that was my first attempt to write software. Uh, and in fact, I think in real life, probably not that many people have used my software anyway, but, um, that idea of using technology to solve problems that was sparked right there, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you, you mentioned that you initially didn't necessarily have the grades to get into med school, but you went on to do a degree in pulmonary medicine. Was there any particular impetus towards this path and did that spark your interest or I guess revive your chances of going into medicine? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, I went through sort of middle school, uh, not, you know, doing okay in, in high school finished strong, uh, to the point where I had a full, I guess what you call a full ride scholarship to the first year of university and, and, um, things were looking good. Uh, at that point I was really thinking about physics or medicine. Uh, um, and I got through my first year with fairly good marks. And I remember, uh, sitting with my physics prof, uh, had a meeting with him and just said, you know, I'm really, these are the two things I'm thinking of. Uh, and, uh, he said, well, you need to think long and hard because they're very different and they have very different trajectories. And, um, I liked the, the mental challenge of physics, uh, but I also liked helping people and it ultimately was helping people that want help. Uh, and just looking at the life of a surgeon versus the life of a physics professor. Um, I just liked more of the excitement. I liked more of the behind the scenes nature of things where I could go where people couldn't go. That, that really appeals to me. Um, well, that was the choice then, but then I didn't do so well in university. It's a lot of people that come on high school and, uh, that, that dream kind of faded. And then I thought, well, uh, maybe I'll go work, uh, in the oil fields or something. And I did that for a while, uh, and, um, did not fit in, um, and, you know, it was great to have that much money and cash. And it was actually nice to be working with my hands, but it was dangerous work. And, um, a lot of my, uh, coworkers got injured. I had an old driller up there who pulled me aside, uh, north of Alberta. And basically he said, you know, you don't, you're not like one of these people here. You have the ability to go and do something more with your life. Um, so why don't you do that? Because I missed that opportunity, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And I live in a van by the, by the drill rig. And he said, you can do something else with your life. So go do it. And so essentially he sent me away. Um, and I went back to university and, and sort of with a new vision that, yeah, I can do something more. And then my grades turned around. Then medicine started to become an option for me. But to get there, <laughs> I had to do graduate school first. Um, and I stumbled into graduate school because of my programming ability that I'd had as a kid. So they were, the lab was looking for a software developer. I hadn't really done much since I was a kid, but I knew I could solve problems. So I took that job. That got me into the lab as a master's student at pulmonary mechanics. That's got my degree. All right. So you took that degree, got into med school, and then you went into trauma surgery, or you did general surgery first at U of A, I believe. Um, yeah. How did that lead down the path to medical innovation? Because you, you've had that, you know, problem solving mindset, but to combine the two, um, in a field that, I mean, can be in conservative, uh, at times, isn't necessarily that springs out as the most obvious thing for everyone. Yeah. Um, funny medicine as it's portrayed in the media 
I think, uh, is much more, um, sci-fi than it is in real life. Much more. Grey's Anatomy? Yeah. Yeah. Much more great. Yeah. And it's not always like that in, in especially public medicine. Um, but yet, you know, we do rely on a large amount of technology and we take it for granted. You're right in that surgical training is, is a lot about, um, becoming more conservative with your thinking and, and accepting risk, but also planning and, and, um, getting ahead of the risk to understand the failure points. But it really, it's about trying to do things the accepted way, the gold standard way, the standard of care. We talk a lot about that in surgery. And that has to do with patient outcomes and safety and, and liability and those sorts of issues. But, um, what I started to realize, and I think a lot of residents do, and I'll talk a bit about more about my surgical innovation week in a minute, but a lot of residents see obvious gaps and obvious problems, things that could be solved with simple solutions, but they're not really given the chance or the support to do that. And certainly I started to see things that I would do differently if it was my medical profession. But as a resident, it wasn't, I was learning the standard of care. Um, and it really wasn't until I finished all of my training and went overseas and started seeing those same problems repeated everywhere. Yet overseas, the, the impact of the problems are magnified because they're resource constrained. Um, that's really when it sparked in me that I could actually use technology and problem solving and design thinking to actually impact lives. That was the, the cool part for me. Mm -hmm. Could you, well, I mean, th there are two questions that kind of stem out of that. I, I think that there's kind of a double edged sword to being a learner in a medical setting because your eyes are fresh. So you can see the issues that people have become acclimatized to and have accepted as part of the system. But at the same time, there is a hierarchy within medicine. So to be able to navigate around that is difficult for residents. So could you tell us a little bit about the surgical innovation week and how you build out the skills and the confidence of uh, surgical learners to address some of these issues because they can spot issues that others might have blind spots to after they're immersed for a long time. Yeah. And to take that a little further, I think people are coming into medicine, either two streams, the traditional stream where you, you go straight through, you get great marks and you go straight into medicine. But there's a, a fair number of people that have had careers before, like nurses or engineers or teachers, or whatever. Uh, and so people come in with different mindsets and different abilities. You know, some of the main, I call the mainstream people that get into medicine never even had a job, you know, didn't work at McDonald's, didn't do anything because they're so busy studying and getting into medicine. Um, and they come to medicine, especially the, the work part of medicine with a uh, almost a naive attitude of what it's like to work in, in any industry. Whereas the people that come with, in, you know, industry experience, they come with a very different mindset. They get what it means to work and have that hierarchy and how to fit into that hierarchy much sooner. Um, and they're used to problem solving a little bit more because they've had to work independently. The traditional path to medicine, I think, um, certainly in the COVID area, uh, you don't interact with as many people. Uh, and I think that's a little bit, uh, it's going to be a little bit dangerous. So when I saw residents, uh, come to me, uh, over the years and, you know, seeing that I'm doing some problem solving stuff, which is totally out of, like we said, out of character for a resident or for a staff, um, they were interested and they wanted to participate and they started coming to me with problems that they wanted to solve with no clue, even how to get started or what that meant to solve a problem. Just like you say, how do you, how do you take an idea and get it into a healthcare setting? What does that pathway look like? And, and so, um, I found myself answering the same questions over and over again. When I finally ended up in, in, uh, Vancouver, uh, UBC general surgery, um, I had colleagues that were very much in the innovative mindset. Some of my colleagues have started companies, actually many of them to solve problems. And so there's a, there's sort of a core group of us that are used to this. Uh, and we decided that we would start uh, this innovation week and the innovation week, uh, was born out of the idea that we teach residents how to do academic research that's mandated actually by the Royal College of Canada and by every other major training college around the world, that residents need to learn how to do studies, interpret studies, use study results to, to inform best practice. But they're never really taught how 
solves problems and they're different things. Uh, academic research gives you knowledge and that, that adds to the growing mountain of knowledge that we have in medicine and it's growing faster and faster, but it doesn't really teach you how to apply that knowledge to a problem to get an outcome that you want. And, and that's a gap that's uniform across, you know, 99% of training programs. Uh, and just, it's just been recently, especially during COVID, that people are starting to think about that differently. And so we started innovation week on, with the, the goal of taking the second year residents out of training for a whole week, which is, doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you, when you understand surgical training, that's a massive event, um, has massive impacts on service and training and education and getting the program, the surgical training program convinced that this was worthwhile, took some doing, but we managed to do it. Uh, and we give them uh, a full intensive workshop day in, day out of design thinking, problem solving skills, and we actually give them problems to solve. Um, and this then a second year now, and the results have been pretty impressive. We timed it at second year because in your third year, you can decide to try and apply for a funded year off to do something else like academic research or now innovation. Uh, and we found that, um, most of our students did take time. Many of them have, have applied and are working or are in big U S innovative schools like Hopkins or Stanford, things like that. Um, I've actually started two or three companies based on some of the projects that have come out of this. Um, we've landed, uh, you know, large amounts of grants in the last couple of years because of this. So it's having an impact and there's this natural drive to solve problems and as surgeons, I think more, more so surgeons than other specialties, because we typically use our hands and our brains to, to solve problems. Um, so it's been really, really exciting. Uh, and I think probably it's going to be a mainstay and interestingly, the new round of medical students that applied to UBC surgery this year, uh, every one of them said that they chose our program in part because we offer that surgical innovation week. And so I think it's, it's the new paradigm, I think in medicine and I'm super excited about it. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, like honestly, if I could just reapply to, to, to specialties, that would definitely be at the top of my mind. I guess pivoting a little bit to your work after your trauma fellowship, what you did at U of Texas, I believe, which had like a, enormous, I guess, resources early on in terms of uh, 3D printing to solve issues in clinic. For example, like you mentioned before, you ended up doing a stint uh, with Doctors Without Borders as well as IC uh, change overall. You mentioned that there was an inciting moment or campaign there um, that really changed your mind as to how technology can be used in a humanitarian way. Could you tell the listeners that story? Cause I, I find it fascinating. Sure. So I, I finished my training, uh, at the largest trauma center in the world. Um, and, you know, the craziest things happened there. We were seeing more injured patients than, than were going on in all the war zones combined across the world at the time at one hospital. Um, and. I walked out of that feeling like I could do anything clinically. I knew how to help people on a one-to-one -one basis, but I didn't know how to help large numbers of people. And so some of my colleagues had joined MSF, some of them had joined ICRC, uh, and I'd, I'd spent some time with MSF and going through the training programs and was uh, about to deploy uh, in Syria at that point. And I, you know, that got canceled for safety reasons. And then I went around the world on my own and, um, basically you know, totally naive. Um, and nowadays probably not something I would recommend, uh, from a, uh, post-colonial global surgery and like a white guy going in and knocking on doors and telling them how to solve problems. It's not the approach I would recommend to people doing <laughs> global surgery, um, but it certainly opened my eyes to some, some problems. And, um, I was in the South Pacific at the time, um, and sort of got to know the, the entirety of the surgical department there that I was touring around hospitals and just seeing, uh, what the challenges were. Cause they're so much different than where I had trained, not so much different than rural, say Canada, like really remote rural Canada, but certainly different than the big cities. Um, and I remember uh, I was at a smaller hospital, probably the third largest hospital on, on the North Island, Fiji. And, uh, they had just received a donation from a big American university 
of some laparoscopic equipment. And that was the first laparoscopic equipment in the, in the country. And laparoscopic equipment allows you to change the way you do surgery. And um, it's now called minimally invasive surgery. A lot of surgeries that you'd be in hospital for a few days for, you could be in hospital for a few hours for. And, um, for example, one of the most common surgeries that are done, gallbladder surgery, uh, it's been done laparoscopically in, in North America for 25 years, but it had never been done that way in Fiji, except in some of the private hospitals. And so it was a real opportunity to change, you know, the, the surgical burden of disease in that country. There's only, there was at the time only 10 functioning ORs in the entire country. Um, and if you could add this technology and this technique there, you could actually greatly improve the number of patients that can get help. So they're really excited about having this equipment. I was excited about uh, helping them set it up because I do laparoscopic surgery. Uh, and there's another surgeon there, I think from Mongolia that does laparoscopic surgery. And we're going through and unpackaging the equipment and quickly realized that a, it was old, outdated equipment. So obviously they was discarded equipment that got donated, which is quite common and unfortunate. Uh, but B, they were missing some pieces, uh, and the pieces themselves were small and not very complicated. They're like connectors, things like that. Um, but to source them would require the hospital to get a large contract service contract with the manufacturer and they couldn't afford that. Uh, and I started thinking of that time, I was just sort of dabbling in 3d printing and thinking we could actually just 3d print these things. Uh, and that would allow them to have the surgical option. What really happened was it just sort of fizzled and died. And I think ultimately it did start it after I left, but it certainly delayed things. And it made me realize that the Western paradigm of surgical equipment, especially the complex surgical equipment doesn't apply in most of the world. And the inability of large corporations, medical device corporations to, um, want to play in that market, to want to really help people in those markets. There's a billion, uh, well, there's 5 billion people on the planet that need access to surgeons that don't have it currently, which is a huge market. If you think about it, there's 140 million, at least new surgeries every year that need to be done to bring the whole globe up to a standard of care that we would call acceptable. So that's 140 million surgeons, surgeries per year where you could apply and sell surgical equipment and devices to. And so far, most of the large manufacturers haven't been willing to get into that market. There's not clear distribution channels. The pricing models don't fit service contracts. Don't, you know, apply there. Um, the equipment actually isn't designed for those hot and humid environments most of the time. And so it's a big gap. Uh, and I started thinking, well, we could just change the way we do that. We could democratize medical device creation so that we could make equipment for the people that need it the most and that 5 billion people. And so. That, that was when the switch flipped for me and I started one of my company's metric technologies to look at and explore that market, how to, how to devise new things for that market. That's a fascinating point, but I mean, I can't help but think that to some degree there is some contradiction there because when like usually with the general media's portrayal of, I guess, uh, work in, uh, providing education to, or resources to areas with underdeveloped health resources, it's done by charities, but you're mentioning all of this in the framework of markets and companies, which is something that I haven't necessarily heard of. So how do you, I guess, resolve, I guess, maybe it's just in my head, this conflict. So I think the, you know, a lot of this came, a lot of this thinking now came after that event. Uh, and working with the NGOs that I worked with, um, which are all entirely health systems NGOs. Mm -hmm. I never really did mission surgical work. I never flew in, operated and left. That was not something I was interested in. What I was interested in is, was building the system necessary. If you think about trauma, for example, uh, when you get injured in North America, you call 911 and then the ambulance is dispatched, you picked up, you go to the hospital, you get treated by trained people. That doesn't happen in most of the world. There's no 911. There's no ambulance. There's no, um, field triage guide to tell you where to bring that patient. There's no emergency department at the hospital that's closest to them. If there's even a hospital and there may be no physicians there. 
So that system that we have, the trauma system is what allows patients to survive serious injury. It's not so much that I'm a skilled trauma surgeon or I'm not a skilled trauma, whatever. It's not so much in one individual's hand and it's not so much in the technology available. It's more in how it's all organized and run and monitored. So that system is really what interested me around the globe. Charities and donations uh, have their role, just like humanitarian aid, which is sort of intervening in times of crisis, like MSF and Red Cross do work very well. Um, but that doesn't always have the aim of building the system when we leave. Uh, you know, if you, if you were to run a healthcare system, even in North America, based on donation alone, you wouldn't have a very good healthcare system because you'd be dependent on the next donation cycle before you could do anything new. And, and donors, they change, they lose their money, they retire, they, they you know, they're, everything changes. And so you don't have a constant source of, of, you know, technology or equipment or people. You can't hire people consistently. And yet we think that, that we're helping low and middle income countries and under resourced countries by giving them stuff. But that doesn't really help. If you've ever been to a low or under-resourced hospital, uh, and you go to the back of it, you'll see a graveyard of donated equipment that is broken down because the system isn't in place for service contracts or, or those sorts of things, or they don't know how to use them because there's, they haven't been, there's no education system there or no referral system to get the patients to them. Or the fact that, uh, the operating room needs a lot of equipment and 99% of it is broken, but that one shiny donated piece of equipment is sitting there or not ready to be used, but it can't be used because everything else is broken. So I'm not a believer that donation by itself works. I just tend to think, imagine I've been hired in that hospital and I'm part of the community and I live there and what would I, based on what I'm seeing, what would I need to to provide a standard of care to that population. You know, my responsibility is to the community I work in here, but it's also my responsibility when I go overseas to that community that lives there. And, um, shiny equipment doesn't get them very far, but building that system behind it and training enough people. And, you know, many or some countries have one surgeon per country or one surgeon per few million people, or even more than that. Um, and that surgeon may not be there the whole time. And so how, how can you provide surgical care, even if you had the best, you know, donated hospital in the world and nobody in it to do anything and nobody educated and no system of education, then that's not going to go very far. So yeah, I, I have a very biased view from my NGO work, my systems NGO work that informs my technology development work. I never make a technology thinking that it's going to be the solution. Uh, I make a technology thinking of how it's going to fit into a system of care. And that's I think, quite important. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, I guess, impactful and interesting way of thinking about the sustainability of systems overall. But I guess to pivot back to your story in terms of how you got to where you are today, between your work, uh, in the South Pacific and now, um, something called the COVID-19 pandemic happened and mm -hmm. you've done interesting work during that period of time. Uh, could you let us know what exactly, I guess, happened, um, and how you were involved with the whole ventilator space, uh, early in the pandemic when there was that big, I guess, huzzah about, about that equipment? Yeah. So I mean, maybe. Most of the population wouldn't have, um, known it, but there, when COVID hit, um, one of the early panic events, though many of them was that countries were realizing that their stockpiles of medical equipment and um, weren't up to snuff. They were out of maintenance cycles. They didn't work. They didn't have as many as they thought they did. The contracts that they thought existed, didn't exist. The system hadn't been stressed or tested. And now it was being stressed and tested. And there was a panic that we wouldn't have enough ventilators, for example, that was one of the areas. Now I had a company that was working on a very low cost ventilator for low middle income countries. And we sort of shelved it because there wasn't a lot of interest to get a ventilator market at that point. Uh, suddenly there was, so 
spent a lot of time, um, you know, designing, working with, partnering with, trying to find ways to get a ventilator made. And at the beginning, thought that was the solution. But given what I had just talked about, how it's more the system than the technology that's the solution, I started to get really concerned. So I saw uh, an incredible upswell of crowdsourced engineering expertise, which was really exciting to see and, and, and participated in, in, I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of hours of discord channels and interviews and, and, you know, this is how ventilator works and this is how we use them. And a lot of really keen, interested people from tinkerers to makers, to professional engineers, to NASA's engineers, to whoever, um, really wanted to, to help. At the same time, there was an incredible outpouring of money from, especially around Silicon Valley. Um, and, um, they were looking for people to guide them through some of the decisions they were making about who to fund and why they should get into this. <laughs> and I saw a really large amount of bad ideas getting out there in the guise of, we're just going to open source it, put it on GitHub and people can then take it and do what they want with it. And they can put their grandma on this ventilator, we'll call it a ventilator because it, and I was really nervous as a clinician, uh, you know, I did not want to be a part of the discussions all of a sudden, because I didn't want to have my name attached to a device that could kill somebody. Um, and I had actually talked to a few military surgeons at the time who, um, had some bad, uh, bad episodes with ventilators that were killing soldiers in the field. Uh, and how long it took them to sort of identify that and how dangerous that was. Um, and so really started to put together a team of, um, medical device creators, regulators, lawyers, clinicians, ethicists, health economists, you know, everybody, I started having these conversations with everybody about we're at a real risk here of getting this wrong. If, if we don't rein in this energy and talk about safety and ethics and quality and these sorts of things, um, more patients could potentially die from these new ventilators than from COVID. And so that, that formed into a white paper that we wrote. It's essentially a guidance document for regulators, businesses, medical device industry, purchasers, clinicians, all of these people that were having questions about ventilators. We wanted to, to write a document that really outlined a few practical steps that we could do. So yes, we were short ventilators, but the solution isn't to make bad ventilators or dangerous ventilation or have people make them in the garages. That's not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is to make more of the ventilators we have. And, and so to upregulate or upscale our capacity to make existing safe, well-trusted ventilators, that's the number one thing that needed to be done. The second thing is if we didn't, if they didn't have the companies have the manufacturing ability to keep up with demand, then to bring in other related fields, manufacturing abilities to do that. Thing. That's what, where the automotive industry and aerospace industry started to talk about making ventilators. They made, you know, highly regulated parts already. It wasn't unusual for them to make something like this and it could be done. Um, uh, then the idea of, um, if we had to make new ventilators, then it should be experienced people making ventilators of a certain kind that would allow the really expensive ventilators, the really complex ventilators to be used for the most complex patients. And then the cheaper, lower, um, lower capacity ventilators to be used for less complicated patients. So basically you could open up some of the best ventilators for the, the COVID patients that needed, whereas post-surgical patients, they don't need fancy ventilators. Um, so there's a lot of strategies that came out of this white paper, which actually attracted a lot of attention. It was kind of a relief when, uh, health Canada and people from FDA and Medtronic and these big players in the field started, um, asking questions and, and looking for some guidance on what to do next. You know, Medtronic just before, just as we were writing this open sourced open source, one of their old ventilators basically opened up all the files and said the, the design files and manufacturing files and said, here, if you know how to do it, you can build this. And when we absolve ourselves of any risk or liability from it, and it was an old ventilator that they made. And I had been working with a lot of ma major manufacturers to try and get that ventilator made. And we quickly realized that it was impossible 
to make the old Medtronic ventilator because we didn't have the old Medtronic manufacturing lines. And to redesign the ventilator to modern manufacturing lines was the same as designing a brand new ventilator. And so while it was a great uh, PR move by Medtronic, uh, and probably with the right intention in mind, uh, it quickly became clear that nobody in the world could make this thing at any scale better than Medtronic and Medtronic should just do it, uh, which is what ended up what happened. So, um, it was, it was a lot of eye opening, a lot of, you know, really deep forays into regulatory, into national purchasing patterns, into health economics, into safety and equality. And, um, it was, a, you know, I was a big learning experience for me, but also my chance to integrate health systems development with NGOs and problem solving and technology. And I think that's, that was really exciting for me. And that's actually sparked a lot of new things, which is where this new LHS labs is sort of started from. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, LHS stands for, uh, learning health systems that learn from previous, uh, previous yeah. issues or mistakes. So I guess, tell us more about LHS because like we've chatted about it already, but it's such a fascinating topic that I think it'd be good to do like a brief overview and then for us to dive a little to the problems that you're trying to solve with it. I'm sure. So, uh, so I had started a, a number of companies, but, uh, they're mostly focused on smaller parts of technology development and you know, some that specialized 3d printing or head manufacturing and things. But what I was getting a lot of questions around was, um, you know, there's, there's, there's problems in healthcare that are simple to solve. They're probably rarer than we think. And there's problems in healthcare that are incredibly complicated and nobody can take them on. Health authorities, meaning uh, institutions that provide healthcare in large populations, like Canada, that would be provincial governments or health authorities in there. And the U.S. is different. Right around the world is different. But large health authorities have all tried to take on the role of solving big problems within their institutions. But they're, they fail most, most of the time. Uh, and they fail uh, a lot of the time because they're not the right people that, that should be solving these problems. Health authorities should be providing healthcare to a population. They should be putting calls out to problem solvers to solve the upcoming problems that they see on the horizon and try and get ahead of it. But they shouldn't be spending all the money on engineers and uh, health economics and all this sort of stuff, specifically around solving problems when they are in fact the problem themselves in a lot of ways. So just by the, the nature of the, the industry, that they are the keepers of healthcare, uh, they may not know where the problems lie. They may not have the institutional wherewithal or machinery to figure out where the problems are, but they know problems exist. Um, LHS labs was created to tackle those biggest, most challenging healthcare problems. The more complicated, the more interdigitating or, or, you know, combined approach necessary, multidisciplinary thinking needed. That's where LHS lab sits most comfortably. Um, where a lot of people would want to break down the problem and reduce it into its smallest parts, that kind of approach doesn't work in healthcare, uh, because you change, you tweak one knob on the giant complex piece of machinery of healthcare and all the other values go out of whack uh, in ways you can't predict. Uh, it's too complicated, it's too chaotic, it's too intertwined. Uh, and it's a mix of historical sort of dogma uh, couched in this new sort of quality initiative that's going on. And those two things don't sit well together. Um, and the people making the decisions may lean towards the old dogma and certainly the new younger hires that are trying to change things from within are more on the evidence-based side of it, but it's still a culture clash. And, uh, LHS has all of the people that have done this before in some capacity in healthcare, whether it be clinicians, engineers, regulatory people, lawyers, health economics. Uh, health entrepreneurs, um, health technologists and government purchase, like everybody that's involved in healthcare sits in LHS lab. Um, we have the ability, and I think it's a skill that is probably the most important of assessing a problem in its true state. You know, people may come to you with a problem, but they may not understand themselves what the problem is. And then if you're going to solve a problem, you really have to understand the problem more than what's being told to you. You really have to go and dig around. And talk to people on the, you know, on the front lines or, or look at the books and look at the economics of it, or talk to the patients. I mean, if you're not talking to patients in healthcare, then you're missing both. And, um, we do that 
And we, I think we do a better job of understanding problems than many groups. And it's only when you understand it, that can you design the solution and the solution may not be technological at all. It may be simply, um, you know, corporatizing a service within a public healthcare system that allows more revenue to join or, or something like that. So that's what LHS does where we, we live in that space of uncertainty and complexity. That, that seems like an uncomfortable place to live, but to, to provide a bit more context and comparison for some of our listeners who might not necessarily know about the procurement process as it is for Canadian healthcare authorities, um, and as it will be, um, if, uh, LHS is able to successfully, um, I guess, support healthcare authorities, uh, could you first lay out what procurement looks like now and what LHS is trying to do? In comparison, sure. So, um, procurement happens in Canada at large scale because health authorities are large entities. And so when, when a procurement office purchases something, they're doing it with a number of things in mind, cost being one of them, uh, you know, universality of the device so that they can have it across all of their hospitals, institutions, uh, safety, um, you know, bundled approaches. So you have multiple things that you can purchase together. Um, and they're, they're quite sophisticated in the way they think about it. Uh, and they, they hold a large amount of purchasing power. So they're good at, at products that have been around for a long time because they, they tested them, they're stable, they know that, but we're now in an era of healthcare where new products are needed rapidly to do new things. Uh, the pace of technological development is increasing. So new generations of devices are coming all the time. Whereas it used to be you'd buy a product for 10 years and you'd be fairly sure that the next purchase from it would be similar. But nowadays devices are changing, you know, yearly cycle. And that, especially in, in fields like surgery, that impacts patient outcomes. You know, if you think about the revolution of laparoscopic equi equipment versus open surgery, which is the old way of doing it, almost overnight, the entire field of surgery changed and patient outcomes changed. That's happening now almost on an annual basis. Uh, you think about mRNA vaccines, for example. So, so health authorities and purchasing offices specifically aren't usually up to speed on how to assess new technologies. So HTAs, health technology assessment pathways, they exist within large purchasing groups, but they're not really all that robust because they haven't had to do it very much. So an example is a, a health authority was looking at a UV robot autonomous robot to go into a COVID infected room and clean it autonomously rather than placing people in a risky position. <laughs> and that technology is brand new since COVID. No one really, you know, they had been doing some UV cleaning before, but the idea of having this autonomous robot all moved everywhere. Lots of companies are trying to do this. As a health authority, how do you know which products on the market by certain vendors? And a lot of these vendors are brand new. Have never had a product before because they're startups. Uh, how do you know and how do you assess that technology? And so, for example, one health authority I know, I put the call out for them and they had more applications and products in front of them that they knew what to do with and no way to figure out if they were good enough in the amount of time necessary to make the decision. And they made some purchases based on what they thought were right. And, and none of the purchases uh, worked out. None of those robots did what they said they could do or met their needs. And so the, the, the concept of a, of a cleaning robot has just died because now what do they do? They just purchase more and waste more money and then go through the cycle again. So LHS labs and a lot of other firms too, but LHS labs does have the ability to, to vet these ideas and understand exactly the requirements that the health authority may have. And it may be not something that the health authority themselves know yet. They may have an idea of how they would use it, but they don't really, haven't really thought much about how that fits in their systems. LHS could help them, you know, really modify or, or clarify their design input requirements. And then LHS labs could go out and find vendors that meet those uh, requirements. It may be that there's a hundred potentials and we can whittle it down to two or three. And maybe that in zero people do that. Zero companies meet the needs of this health authority, in which case we can help either startups or spin our own companies because we have technology development people to meet those needs of a large purchaser. I think if you're developing, the one thing I could say to new health technology developers out there 
uh, whether it be makers or industry or startups or whatever, if you don't have a person willing, so health technologies are used by different people. They're used by the user, which is typically a clinician. They're in some ways it's used by the patient, meaning the device is being used on the patient. <laughs> but also importantly is someone actually has to pay you and buy it. Uh, so there's three people really involved in, in the life cycle of a health technology. And if you don't have a good understanding of all three of those people, your technology isn't going to go anywhere. You could have the best device that everybody wants to use and patients feel is the greatest, but if purchasers don't understand it, they're not buying it and, and vice versa. Purchasers may under not understand how it's used at all, but like the price point and buy it. But clinicians who use it say that's off. That's quite common. Or patients may say, you know, what the hell is this thing? Why am I doing this? Uh, and not understand why or how it's used. So as a health technology creator, I would recommend don't even getting started unless someone has told you they would pay money for that. Meaning it solves a problem that's in front of them. That's key. If it doesn't solve a problem that's in front of somebody, then you're trying to push a new device into a market where there's millions of devices out there. So you want to be pulled into a market by someone that says, I have this problem. I will pay money for a good solution. That's step one. Step two is make the, the solution, uh, and understand the people that are using it and understand the people that's being used on very well and the system that it's going into. And then a lot of the design needs to be not around the technology itself and all the requirements necessary to get through regulatory, but a large amount of it needs to be on. Is it culturally a good fit for where it's going to be used? For example, the new ventilators that were coming out of the COVID era, they were big steel boxes and they didn't look like a ventilator. And as a clinician who may put a patient on a ventilator in the middle of a pandemic, I would not reach for this new device that looks like it's an industrial beer fridge or something. Like I'm not going to put a patient on that because I don't trust that it works and I don't have the time to learn how to use it. And the nurses or the respiratory therapists don't know how to turn it on. And when it turns on, it doesn't do all the things that normal medical device does. It, it has a loading screen written in Unix and they don't understand that. So, um, so spending a lot of time around product design and how it's, how it's used human factors design and interface design, it's really, really key. It may not be the sexiest thing, or it may not be why you got interested in making a device at all, but if nobody wants to use it on a patient then nobody's going to use it. And so then even if the purchaser, you, you managed to get through the purchaser door, but now the clinicians don't want to use it. Well, that device is going to die. And then the third thing is understand how it's used on a patient and what that means. And so if you can do those things that requires you to know business or have people that can do business, that means sales and, and sustainability and pass the market means you have to have a clinician or several clinicians, et cetera. Uh, around the world in different contexts, because the context changed how technologies are used. And it means you have to spend a lot of time with patients. And if you haven't done those things, but you have the greatest device in the world, it's not going anywhere. Um, you have to really check those boxes before you even get started. I think there's, there's two points that kind of stem out of what you just said. Number one is that what you're building with LHS is extremely multidisciplinary and that flies in the face of running a lean startup with trying to get viewpoints where necessary, but not expanding the team too much so that you don't have to pay everybody because you can't just frankly, as a startup, your, your resource limitation is money. So with what you're building with LHS, doesn't that threaten to flip the model of how healthcare innovation is done? And how will the other systemic factors of how healthcare innovation is done interact with this new model if it is put into place? Yeah. So, um, it flips a few things on its head. Um, but I think in, if you were to talk to really intelligent health technology investors, for example, which is really, that's another factor that you, if you haven't addressed yet, if you don't know what an investor is thinking, then you're probably not going to get very far. You need to have somebody in your team that knows that. Um, and I'm learning that, but, um, and investors are changing. They're becoming much more savvy. Um, there was, you know, in COVID when every dot comer wanted to put money into the save the world from COVID device, 
they're dumping money in just some, for, some of these horrible devices, that was, the unsafe devices I was talking about before. Uh, and even some of the industrial grants that were coming out were, were targeting really bad devices. But because the technology looks so good, they liked it. Um, so you have to have this new sort of generation of, of investor, these so -called, some of them are called impact investors, where they're, you know, they're not just looking for returns, they're looking for a positive impact and something that's important to them. Uh, that's important. But the investors themselves need to, if they're pivoting into healthcare investing, they need to understand that as well, because it's easy to get caught up in investing in the coolest new cutting edge technology that nobody else has. That's going to 10x, but it doesn't 10x because it doesn't take into account who the purchaser is, what the problem really is, who's using the device and, and who they're using it on. And so I, I don't think it flips things. I think it's a more comprehensive way to do device creation. When you get an investment for your company and your startup that's got this thing and you think in this way, then it, your comment are all, you have to hire all these experts to pay them. Well, that's mandatory in my books, because if you don't have these people on giving their opinions, you're not likely to hit the mark. And so it becomes a non-negotiable fact in the investment discussion is that I can't do this without these people advising me. And so that's not a luxury to have, that's actually the way it needs to be done. And, and the turnaround is if, if the entire industry changed that, I think the success rate of new devices would be higher. I think there would be uh, a lot more collaboration between say potentially competing startups that each one and grab a piece of the pie, but that they have overlapping expertise, they're more likely to succeed if they join forces. Uh, and so I think a lot of sort of that, you know, traditional business startup mentality where you figure out your competitive landscape and how you're different from them. I think also you should probably figure out where you're similar and where your ethics and ethos may align. And then rather than compete against them, maybe join them uh, and see what happens. And I think that's, that's part of that new paradigm shift as well. I do. I'm aware that we're running close on time, but we've talked a lot about the Canadian landscape so far, and I'm not sure if you've delved into this, but how does what LHS labs do, um, generalize to other countries? I know that for example, the NHS, um, and other countries, uh, or other healthcare systems that to some degree have a, uh, public focused, I guess, mandate, uh, may be generalizable, but what about the States? Like, does the model also yeah. apply there? I think the model applies anywhere. If you really understand the context of where you're designing for your solution will fit better into the system. So one of the NGOs I'm working with is working on a medical device manufacturing space based in Nairobi. Uh, and part of it will be an academy to teach new innovators how to understand problems low. Now they understand problems. I say they, but people in a context understand problems quite well. If you think about, you know, the problem in traffic where you live, you will understand that way better than an external consultant ever will because you drive it every day. It's the same thing in, in healthcare. People that are working in a context and providing healthcare to people, they're just as passionate about healthcare as everybody else. And they want the same outcomes and they want the same level of care, the same standard of care. They don't want hand-me-downs and secondhand equipment that's broken. They don't want the same equipment that people are using around the world. We can design for that. That could be a design input and, and the cost can be uh, modified and the, the functionality can be modified to meet those needs. You know, a lot of the bells and whistles you see on the highest end equipment sold in America doesn't need to be there. It's feature creep. It's, it's marketing. It's, it's not necessarily necessary or have proven outcomes for what you need to do. So just by changing your design requirements, you could, and understanding the problem and the need for those design requirements, you can put any device in any market and I think do well, uh, your margins may be smaller but the numbers that you're going to sell may be higher. And especially if you start thinking about a circular economy and regional manufacturing using new manufacturing methods, I think you can get to a reasonable business model anywhere in the world. That's fascinating. And with that, uh, we're going to close off. Before we close off, do you have any pluggables that you like to plug any links, uh, social media at all? Uh, just lhslabs.com is it's the website we're doing. Come join forces, send me an email. Uh, if you're a surgical trainee or a health, you know, medical student or anybody in healthcare that wants to join the innovation week, we're opening it up this year. So we're going to have multiple people, 
uh, come watch the, the output from that. These are the new startups that will get spun off. If you're an investor that wants to learn more about this, uh, you know, I'll be knocking on your door shortly and, uh, yeah, come join and, and change things. We're trying to build it Western Canada and Pacific Northwest first, but we're scaling as quick as we can. As you know, we're already starting to scale to Nairobi and other places. So.